Welcome everyone. This will be a fun discussion about the future of skepticism and I suppose uh, uh, while it's featuring people whose opinions I think are informed even if they're not all in agreement about some of these issues and I want you to hear these opinions, um, uh, I suppose first we should define a bit what we mean by skepticism. So uh, for the purposes of this conversation, skepticism is at once the approach to claims that we prize, the, the, the approach that we prize to certain unfounded claims, and also uh, the growing worldwide movement of folks who are working at the grassroots and in other areas to advance that approach to claims. Now, quick intros to the panelists so uh, we can get into the discussion. There is Jamie Ian Swiss, whom you all know, longtime contributor to the JREF, advisor to the organization. There's Tim Farley, a JREF fellow and someone who leads the way when it comes to online skepticism. He does skeptools.com and whatstheharm.net. Uh, there's Reed Esau, co-founder of Skepticamp, which are informal, community-based skeptic conferences at the local level, really not just all around the United States now, but all around the world. And there's Barb Drescher. She serves on the James Randi Educational Foundation's advisory, uh, educational advisory panel, and uh, she has taught at uh, she has taught at Cal State Northridge. She has studied. She she uh, focuses on perception, critical thinking, and attention. So, panel, first off. And uh, let's start with Jamie. Uh, Jamie, do, you've been involved with skepticism for decades, more than I think anyone else of us on this, uh, in this discussion. And uh, so given your experience in this with uh, National Capital Area Skeptics, uh, Bay Area Skeptics. New York, New York, um, not Bay, not Bay Area, uh, New York City. Uh, New York City Skeptics, yeah. Um, apologies. Uh, do you see this stuff we're all part of, the movement aspect, do you see it growing? Uh, and I guess maybe, is it even a movement or are we complimenting ourselves when we talk in those sorts of terms? I think we have, we have unmistakable, uh, incontrovertible evidence that it's a movement, both a movement and a growing movement. I think there might have been a time when we wondered if it was a movement or we were hoping that it was a movement. Certainly in the early days of PSYCOP, we were kind of hoping it was a movement, whatever that movement might be. But um, I think, uh, you know, there's a JREF tally now of over 200 skeptic organizations, activities, if you count skeptics in the pub, meetup groups, etc. And that's excluding humanist and atheist groups, over 200. You know, when Psychop was born, there was Psychop. Uh, so I, I think it's unmistakably growing. I think that's terrific. I'm all for local skeptic activism for all sorts of reasons. Uh, I think it's an undeniable trend. Hmm. Anybody else? You, you think this is necessarily growing uh, as, as a worldwide movement? We uh, use that phrase a lot. I, I, <coughs> sorry, I'm not excusing the microphone. Uh, I'm seeing it, everything uh, growing as well as uh, uh, retreating in some respects. In my experience as a meetup organizer, I saw a lot of people signing up for the meetups, but they immediately became inactive. And so the numbers at meetup, while they are growing, uh, uh, overestimate the actual number of people that are involved. And so I, I'd, I'd say for any given set of numbers, uh, be skeptical and, uh, and take a close look at it. <laughs> I, I'm sure that's true and, and especially for something like meetups and I think it demonstrates the difference between what organizing is and sort of, you know, gathering. Because a meetup very often doesn't, no one puts in any more to it than having a little coffee get together at their, at their home or, or and that's the nice thing about skeptics in the pub is that it's, it's kind of easy. You, you already have, you pick a place to do it and then you go and do it and it's fun and social and I think that's really good. Um, but with a meetup, you know, someone has to take charge, someone has to maintain, someone has to organize and sometimes people don't realize that until after the fact and that's the difference between a meetup and a, and a real organization. You know, organizations that either realize sooner or later that you need infrastructure, you need to be doing things, you need to be doing outreach, you need to be running uh, lectures or, or whatever it is, um, that's what creates an or that's what creates an organization. Barb, um, well, what I what I'm hearing I, I think highlights the dichotomy between activism and identification. Hmm. You know, there's a difference between um, claiming an ideology, which I think we kind of do. We share an ideology and a way of thinking, 
and um, being invested in whether or not other people share that or maybe preventing the harm that, that some of the things that we fight you know, mm. do. Mm. And th there's a difference there. So they may sign up for you know, those types of groups because they want that identification or they want to express that they identify and aren't necessarily able to kind of work that into their lives as a priority. I did a uh, census uh, last year, and I recently redid it, of uh, skeptic podcasts, because I was interested in how many were out there. And podcasts are at least a definable thing that you can find, because there's iTunes and places where they get aggregated. And podcasts also have a defined beginning, which was uh, April, May of 2005, when there were two. And uh, uh, now there are 96. Um, and about 30 have gone by the wayside, and so there was a huge, huge growth in the years in between. Um, slow growth at first, and then a huge explosion in 2000, 2008, and for, or 2008, 2009, and for some reason I'm noticing a little bit of a leveling off uh, right now, where it's hovering around 95, 96 for the last year or so. Mm. And I don't know if that means anything, but certainly 96 skeptic podcasts, and, and that's, uh, as Jamie said, where he was leaving out the humanist groups, I left out all the atheist podcasts. I was focusing just on the ones that had significant science content, uh, just for sheer, you know, trying to keep the scope down of what I had to measure. And, uh, and uh, they also found that there were about 10 languages. Uh, most of them obviously are in English, but uh, a bunch of other languages represented, which was very encouraging. Hmm. So if we look out at this audience at the Amazing Meeting 2012, uh, I think it's relevant to this conversation to realize there's uh, something like 21 countries represented in this audience. There's 46 states, all but four states. Uh, and uh, what, what that suggests to me is that whatever TAM is, it's reaching out to a lot of folks, especially when you consider the factor that just right around 50% of the people who are here this year are at TAM for the first time. And that's pretty consistent over the years. And in that sense, I consider TAM sort of an outreach vehicle. Um, if you look at the history of the organized skeptics movement, uh, you see that it didn't really start out with a group of skeptics in a back room uh, sort of plotting and planning to create a worldwide movement. Instead, a group of public intellectuals and authors and scientists and critics uh, looked around in the mid-70s and, and said, I, I don't really like the... It, well, in, in the 60s, the, the organizations weren't founded. In the 60s, there were right. public intellectuals okay, okay, who were okay. speaking out. But the, the sort of organized skeptical movement in the 70s, <laughs> few, few folks got together and said, we want to do something about that nonsense what are we going to do? So James Randi, Paul Kurtz, Isaac Asimov, list of uh, folks said, well, what we should do is publish magazines and, and write things and speak in the media. But out of that came this growing network of grassroots groups. So all of us are involved with skepticism in, in one sense at the national level. We're involved with national organizations. We are uh, leading uh, national efforts, et cetera. Uh, most of us are involved at the local level. Which came first for you, local or national? Uh, for me, it was national, I think. There was a local organization in Atlanta, and it had kind of petered out, and then I came to TAM, and so I got involved here first, and then we started up a new local organization. Mm. Uh, for me, it started out with uh, uh, a new Denver Skeptics Group, which had replaced uh, didn't replace. Uh, it came a few years after a uh, Rocky Mountain skeptics, which had been in Colorado uh, 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 for decades before. And uh, we started as a uh, social group, and that's uh, with the uh, experimenting with the Skeptic Camp open events. And that's how we had gotten uh, started locally, but Skeptic Camp eventually became an international phenomenon. Hmm. I I don't, I, you know, for me, I guess it's sort of simultaneous, but that if I count teaching, which is a big part of it, it was just me. It wasn't, you know, like I organized with another group of people, but I've taught skepticism for a lot longer than I've been involved in the organizations and what they do. So probably Even before first. you self-identified as a Actually, skeptic? no, because that goes back to high school. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was approached by one of those, you know, the Bay Area skeptics, which was only a couple of years old at the time. And... Um, that's how I learned what skeptic was. So um, I think when I started teaching, I, I just, that's 
seemed like what needed to be taught at the time, so I was always teaching it. Hmm. Jamie? For me, it was, it was local, and I'm, I'm glad it was. And it gave me, a, I think, a different perspective, perhaps, than if it had happened from the top down for me. I was a PSYCOP supporter at a distance. I read Skeptical Inquirer and so on. But it was 1985, and I was in Washington, D.C. As, as a resident performer at a club there. I met Chip and Grace Denman. Uh, we found out right away we had magic in common, we had PSYCOP and Skeptical Inquirer in common. We were kind of amazed that uh, there were no skeptic organizations in Washington, D.C. We thought that maybe the nation's capital could benefit from such a thing. <laughs> a little rationality, you know. Uh, and two years later, we were still sort of complaining about the fact that no one had done it. And then one day it dawned on us, oh, it's probably going to have to be us. Uh, and we, uh, Chip and Grace and I, with the help of... Um, uh, the late Phil Klass, uh, one of the great warrior skeptics from PSYCOP, uh, who was in the area also, uh, started the National Capital Area Skeptics. Mm -hmm. So we've uh, rehearsed a bit about the history of this organized worldwide skeptics movement as it's growing. Uh, but recently, so I've been involved in this, what, 15 years, and I feel like it's changed a lot. In, it's changed more in the last few years than it has in the longer span uh, of my involvement before that. Um, so let's explore the various ways skepticism as something we're doing, not as something, not as a position we have, uh, but the activism part of it, how that's changing. So Tim, you've really led the way in identifying and cultivating approaches for advancing skepticism even outside of the, uh, the groups people might go to once a month. Yeah, there's a lot of really exciting things going on in the internet because it, it seems like one of the fundamental things that we could be doing is trying to reach out to essentially the customers of our competitors, right? It's the customers of psychics, the customers of homeopaths. Because a lot of these people don't know what they're getting into. Uh, we've had people show up at our Atlanta Skeptics in the pub and get upset that we were saying bad things about homeopathy. And then we said, oh, have you never heard the explanation? And we explained it to them and they were shocked. Mm -hmm. So sometimes simple things like that can, can reach people. And so uh, I've been making my specialty studying ways that we can get skeptical information in front of people using the <coughs> internet. And there's a lot of interesting things going on in terms of uh, marketing, local marketing, like ways that businesses put themselves on the internet so they show up in Google Maps and things like that, and the way websites are raided and blocked because there's so many hackers and all this other scams and stuff on the internet. And I've been doing things through my blog where I teach skeptics how to use these tools to get a skeptical message out there. So for instance, uh, using the uh, Web of Trust tool to put a negative rating on sites that are selling pseudoscience and crap so that if the person happens to have that tool installed on their computer, they'll get a big warning on their screen. Um, they may have to dig a little deeper to find out why that warning is there, but at least it'll stop them for a moment and say, hey, somebody thinks this is bad. Maybe mm. I should uh, look further. Mm. I think of myself as taking activism in a new direction, or at least in a non-traditional direction. Uh, my emphasis, or my focus with the Skeptic Camp events is not outreach, which a lot of people might think, oh, open events, outreach. The Skeptic Camp events are focused principally on knowledge sharing and skill development for skeptics, for the 95% of us in this room to become better skeptics. Mm. And so it's, uh, while ultimately Skeptic Camp can feed things like the harm reduction and other forms of activism, the principal, the principal uh, activist goal for Skeptic Camp is to make us better skeptics. Mm. So, uh, Reed, when you look at how a lot of the national uh, organizations first supported local outfits, local groups, uh, subscriber databases, you know, they were mailed in a geographical region and said, hey, uh, you guys subscribe to this magazine, you care about these issues, you want to meet everybody, this is before Meetup, before the internet, uh, you know, get together and we'll help foster a group, said some of these national organizations, PSYCOP I'm thinking of primarily. Uh, contrast that uh, in ter with your model in terms of how you get a new skeptic camp. Is it all uh, people who are already self-identified and then they just sort of do it on, on their own or? Um... Uh, well, skeptic camp is ultimately based upon a, uh, a conference model, a, a wildly successful conference model from the tech community called Bar Camp, 
And these are organized in an ad hoc fashion. Uh, the first bar camp took place in 2005 and was organized in two weeks by a bunch of people and they had uh, like a turnout of 200 people and they just, and, and the conference was basically giving talks to one another. And so to actually assemble the skeptic camp, it doesn't, uh, organizations can support the skeptic camp, but ultimately uh, the, the skeptic camp comes together driven by social media, uh, like, like Meetup and Facebook and Twitter, and that's what gets everybody together. And anyone can do a skeptic camp, skepticcamp.org. Uh, anyone can plug in and uh, we were just in Madrid a couple months ago and they had the month before had their first skeptic camp so this is something going on all around the world but your emphasis is it's for skeptics it's not reaching out and engaging with our cultural competitors oh, that's great I, I, or that's that's right that's uh, it's a I consider it a prerequisite to activism once you master the skills of skepticism uh, by all means step into a role of activism but focus on those skills beforehand. So how do we as a movement that's not really widely <coughs> professionalized, and I mean, there, there's a couple dozen of us might work, uh, draw a little paycheck uh, doing this sort of stuff, but most of us, it's a labor of love. You know, all of you have other full-time jobs and still find the energy to do everything that you're doing. Um, so how do we uh, figure out in a, a movement that's not professionalized to that degree, uh, to care about quality control? Or uh, is the option, hey, we're open to all comers, we're interested in, in uh, fun topics, and let's get together and socialize, and uh, th they might have religion or the paranormal over here. Over here, we have skepticism. Oh, well, for the Skeptic Camp events, these are uncurated events, which means that anyone can do a talk, and uh, as long as it's somewhat related to science and skepticism, and so you get a full, uh, you get a, uh, a wide diversity of talks that are being given. And uh, occasionally you have to deal with misinformation of speakers that get up and are, are deliberately misrepresenting the truth or inadvertently misrepresenting the truth. And so for Skeptic Camp, the, the principal method of quality control that we have is to simply raise your hand during a talk and ask a question. And the speaker is, is compelled to deal with that, uh, deal with that question uh, as, a, uh, as a collaborative form of quality control. Hmm. Well, that's, skepti that's skepticism by doing, right? Mm -hmm. Where they're learning skepticism by doing it right there at, at Skeptic Camp. We had that happen at Atlanta Skeptic Camp last year. We had uh, one of our presenters who's a regular in the, in the group uh, basically came in and was presenting a conspiracy theory mm -hmm. that she believed in. And uh, it was kind of entertaining to watch the chat because there were people watching a live stream and the people in the chat just kind of went a little bit berserk. And we made sure that during the Q&A we pushed back real hard on her, that she didn't have her evidence in, in a row and, and she, didn't, she hadn't done her homework on this particular uh, theory and uh, uh, hopefully that came across. Hmm. You know, it, it's, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Say that. What, I, what I'm hearing here is I find it really interesting because that's exactly how academics works. That's exactly how science works. There, there's no you know, overlord of science who decides what is and is not good science. <laughs> there is a culture and everybody gets a say and the researcher who's being criticized has to take that criticism, accept it and improve their research or it won't be accepted by the community. And I think that's one of the reasons why we see so much of what people call infighting on the internet because there's so many grassroots people involved and, and everybody's kind of fighting for control of the content. And something's gonna probably win out, you know, stuff gets sifted and it goes in waves and, and just like science does. And that's how we work yeah. things out, but that's how human beings work things out because we, mm. we don't have the overlord of skepticism either. No, except Randy. So, so the optimism inherent in public debate is that if you do good public <laughs> debate, the best ideas for either side, yeah. the, the, be, the very best ideas win out. Now, maybe that's sort of a faith claim because there's something called rhetoric and you can deceive people with your words and all that stuff too. But it seems to me that the, uh, the skeptic camp model is sort of uh, different than the, lo the uh, local group skeptic organization model 
at least in the sense that the local groups I've been part of, they have monthly lectures, people come in, uh, you're, you get informed about something interesting, and then you go socialize. Yeah, uh, you can think of Skeptic Camp as being, uh, as opposed to the, uh, the formal education of a skeptic's, uh, or the structured education of a skeptic's toolbox, Skeptic Camp would be similar, but it's peer-based education. It's us, yeah. it's us learning, uh, sharing what we know and learning from each other. Hmm. What, one of the things that I emphasize almost, in almost every talk that I give is for skeptics that, because we do need, there's so much nonsense out there, we need as many people as possible to push back, especially on the local level, but you need to do your homework. So one of the things that I emphasize is specialization. Uh, if you're doing stuff on the internet um, and you have a website or whatever it is that you're doing, uh, pick a pick a topic, pick a subtopic, because we've got a lot of stuff going on in skepticism, you know, everything from UFOs to Bigfoot to denialism to alt-med, there's so much stuff that I know I can't keep up with it all. So I recommend that uh, on skeptics who want to do stuff online, pick a slice and then just dig deep and read the books and read the articles and make sure you know everything there is to know about that slice of skepticism and then find where you're needed online and make, make your knowledge of it. An example uh, who comes to mind is Susan Gerbic and her right. work. You, you want to uh, explain yeah, that sort of project? I, uh, people can get involved. One with. of the tools that I push my blog is called Skept Tools and because I was trying to push people try to use the tools that are out there on the internet uh, to advance skepticism and one of the things that I talked about early on like three years ago was Wikipedia getting on Wikipedia and and making sure there's skeptical content and that the content that relates to our topics is good and there's a lot of reasons to do that and Susan saw that and saw a presentation that I gave on a JREF cruise actually and took it to heart and she made that her specialty. And so she's got a whole blog just devoted to Wikipedia and she organizes people to edit stuff on Wikipedia and she's working on a new project now and uh, relating to translating stuff into other languages on Wikipedia. And so that's, that's exactly what I mean is, you know, just, just dive in there and find your area and that way you, you can focus on it and uh, learn all there is to know. I think Reed and Tim both make excellent points about the, the need for this kind of training within and expertise within, and I think it's, these are important arguments, for example, for why one of the valuable roles of JREF is to serve as resource and support for local skepticism. I think that's a, I think that's a powerful role for the organization among other, among other services provided. But I also think at the same time that that need for expertise and to know what we're talking about before we talk about it, uh, should not be considered a discouragement to local activism because invariably what sure. happens with local activism is people want to get involved and people want to do something and they don't, and not everybody has the expertise. Well, that's true. And uh, you can't wait around until you have enough expertise or enough experts, uh, especially on the local level to have experts on every subject. You do need to reach out before you open your mouth, absolutely. Um, but the desire to do something the willingness to put out that energy and effort to do something, to gather people, to put on a monthly public lecture. When we started NCAS, we almost immediately began a lecture series that pretty quickly after the first, by the second year, I think was up to 10 lectures a month, three lectures a month, and we've done that ever since. And New York City Skeptics, one of the first things we did with New York City Skeptics as well. And we do other things, but those you know, fundamental, basic things of a, of, a, of a regular lecture, of a skeptic in the pub, a more sociable thing. Uh, you, you don't have to be expert to do those things. You, you just have to have a willingness and a desire and, a, and a, maybe a passion about the, about the cause. Mm -hmm. So what I love about these resources, I'm a fan of both. We've, we've, I, I, I love what's a harm and, and uh, we've, been, uh, we've uh, used a, supported skeptic camp efforts with New York City skeptics. Um, I, I love all that and, and, and we do need more of that uh, to provide that expertise for skeptics to uh, educate ourselves and equip ourselves, but there's no substitute and even expertise is not a substitute for, hey, I want to do something, goddammit. Mm -hmm. this, this is true, so, but you have to be able to recognize the, what, you, what you reasonably should be able to do as a non-expert mm -hmm. and, and where you need to consult somebody who Absolutely. is an expert. Absolutely. And with the, the skeptic movement as big as it is and, and the people that are involved, we have 
somebody for just about any question that you would want. Yeah. Somebody. You just need to reach out to them because most, most people are pretty responsive. So in this part of those, this discussion, as we're exploring the future of skepticism, we're really talking about the lay of the land right now. And I hear everyone on the panel drawing a distinction between working to educate folks from a skeptical point of view about various topics and activism to make a difference, activism to change something. Obviously, educating folks changes things too. But it seems to me that was the distinction that you were drawing. And, uh, Simon Singh comes to mind and the uh, chiropractic campaign in the UK where grassroots groups, local groups, pub groups, etc. Uh, all sort of from the bottom up coordinated a campaign that was activist in nature, not e educating people, the general public, right. as much about chiropractic as it was pushing back against chiropractic, right? And it had great effect. Do you think there are similar opportunities for folks who self-identify as skeptics, who are plugged into the movement, but aren't uh, going to be experts in an area like Tim just suggested? Not everyone wants to carve out an expertise or a niche field and stake his or her claim on that. You know, not everyone wants to do the homework on the history, what, of Bigfoot lore, right? Um, so well, are, are there are, similar opportunities here for us? I, I think, you know, some people are, are great designers, can design logos or, or you know, it, it, Tim's a good example of someone whose technical expertise is so invaluable to the community that it wouldn't matter if he didn't know anything about skepticism, which he clearly does. He offers us, it's gold, right? And you don't necessarily have to even have a great understanding of um, how scientific studies work, as long as you recognize what you do and don't know, and you use the strengths that you have in ways that help, you're helping and you're, you're making a difference. A well, and some of it can be a huge difference. And that was a good example, the Simon Singh thing. Uh, one of the ways that they pushed back on the chiropractors is they, they knew, uh, you know, just from experience, that a lot of the chiropractors were making claims that were not legal under British law and the regu advertising regulations on their websites. And so a couple of people led by, mainly by Simon Perry, went out and they went to every single chiropractic website in the UK and scored, you know, just went over every piece of text that was on there and got copies of it all and found where the language was wrong. And they filed hundreds and hundreds of complaints with the chiropractor's own regulator and just made this, this paperwork nightmare for them. Uh, in response to them making a nightmare for, for Simon. And what they did to follow up on that is it happens that Simon Perry uh, ha has a software company and he had his guys build a tool uh, called Fish Barrel that plugs into your web browser and uh, helps automate that process. So instead of having to, to sit there and laboriously copy all this information down, it, with a little bit of knowledge of what phrases you're looking for and what things they're not supposed to say, you can go in there with the tool and literally just mark it in your web browser, click a button, and it'll take you right to the complaint form for your country. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you fill out the complaint and tell them who you are and it files. And you know, this doesn't work that great in the US because our agencies aren't as responsive. But in the UK, it's an awesome thing. And they, they literally, every week, there's announcements that, uh, oh, we made, we made this uh, chiropractor take this off his site. And we mm -hmm. made this uh, herbalist take this off their site. And uh, they're one by one scrubbing all this crap mm -hmm. off the internet. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it takes a lot of people doing that because there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these websites. So we need people to jump in and help out. And so that example suggests that you don't need to be an expert in chiropractic. You don't have to have written the book Simon Singh wrote. Uh, instead, you just have to be willing to put in some time. Yeah. Uh, so just like uh, the SETI project, right? You, you, not everyone needs to be an astronomer to help search for extraterrestrial intelligence. This is new technology allowing anyone who cares about the issues to plug in, get involved, and be active. Uh, are, do you think that will only grow with time, or is it really just an empty playing field that it's up to us to in, you, you know, poke around, find these new opportunities? I, I think it's growing. I, you know, every, every time I look, I find new things out there that potentially could be used in this way. And we're starting to see 
folks actually building tools that are more specifically designed for this sort of thing. There's a guy here uh, who built a tool called Rebutter. And uh, I'm noticing a lot of activity amongst the kind of digital end of the newspaper industry in the US where they're concerned that their industry is uh, you know, dying. Um, and they're trying to look toward the future. And one aspect of that that they're trying to attack is how do you, how do you fact check when there is no editor for blogs or, you know, or Twitter or anything, and you just have all this random information out there, is there any way to know what's true and what's not? Uh, so people are trying to figure out ways to build automated fact-checking tools or automated tools that will identify suspect phraseology in websites and stuff like that. So there's a lot of, a lot of that stuff is still in development, and probably a lot of it won't go anywhere, but it's interesting. It's really interesting. I, th I think the Simon Singh chiropractic is a very interesting case and a very encouraging one for the value of the skeptic community. You asked EJ about, you, you posed a distinction between education and activism, right? In my experience, education is a really strong service to be provided by, by local groups along with socializing, which is, I think, a very valid and primary purpose for local organization. And activism is hard for local groups. It, it doesn't mean local groups can't do it. There's, there's plenty of good examples. But it's also difficult for local groups to get, in, get the press's attention, yeah. and, and depending on the size of the community they're in, to have all the resources you need to yeah. really make a, an impact with a particular campaign. So activism, I think, was more the role of national groups, right? That had a better, better tools uh, to get at the media and things like that. But well, in the last 35 years, there aren't many examples of national skeptic organizations issuing national campaigns that had measurable impact. Right, but they could support particular, I mean, look at Randy for many years, had the support of PSYCOP until, oh, right, he, right. until he didn't. Right. Uh, but had the support of PSYCOP in some of his sort of big steps, right? right big right. attack. And of course, PSYCOP began with a petition about astrology. Right, so that was that was activism, right? right? The very first thing Psychop ever did that created Psychop. But the Simon Singh case is a really good, good example. I think maybe the most dramatic example we we've ever had to date about just the service, the value of the simple size and spread of skepticism. Mm. It wasn't a movement that was uh, it was done by a particular group, no particular skeptic group. But you know, I I was talking to Simon about this last year. And I said, you know, I don't want to be putting words in your mouth. I'm, I'm going out and saying certain things about this. I've been talking to you since all this began. You know, but do you agree or disagree? It seems to me that a lot of your success with this was really, wouldn't have happened without the skeptic uh, world. Because even though other people piled on, including the scientific community, the scientific community was late to the table compared to the skeptics, right? I think that the, the noise that the skeptic community created made it sort of safe to, for the scientific community to step up and, and, and get a yeah. sense of outrage about what was going on. And Simon absolutely agreed with that, that the skeptics were the first ones on the line to come to his defense and, and, act, and be active and do things. And I think we're gonna, we have other examples. You know, the, the, the bomb detectors, are, it's a similar thing. Not so much organized, where you point to a national organization or a particular local organization, but the sheer numbers of skeptics getting behind a cause that they care about made a difference. Hmm. So in the, the conversation we're having about the future of skepticism, not once did any of us mention atheism or the future of atheism. I think most of us are atheists or skeptics of God or something. Uh, a good 60 something percent, high 60 percent of the people in this audience use the word atheist to self-describe. Uh, and of those who don't, they probably are sort of skeptical of God, al although it should be said there are a number of Christians self-identified in the audience and, and people who have other sorts of religious beliefs. Um, if you look at the last year, since last TAM, there's been something like 26 uh, regional or national skeptic or allied big events, like conferences people register for. There was the Reason Rally that reportedly had something like 16,000 people or, or more attend that event. Uh, so if we're talking about the future of skepticism, um, is that going to be alongside and separate from this larger thing that also seems to be growing? Is it like a niche in that? Or uh, is, it, uh, is it of a piece? Nobody wants to try this one first. <laughs> I, 
I would point Let's to, say the I, larger I, rationalist I, movement, yeah. I would point to Carl Sagan's baloney detection kit, which enumerated the various tools of skepticism that's, that scientists use professionally that have practical value to us all as one of our core assets, what's one of our distinguishing features that we have in scientific <laughs> skepticism. And I would say, so long as we are embracing that sort of scientific skepticism, we, we stand apart, we're unique within that larger, uh, larger uh, movement. I wouldn't. I would just change the language and say not within that larger movement. I. I don't. It, it may all be a rationalist movement in a sense because we all promote critical thinking, or at least we claim to. But um, I think that skepticism is more about the thinking and the evaluation of evidence, and it is about drawing conclusions and um, becoming, you know, emotional about how other people draw their conclusions or where they're where they're at with their conclusions. I think we're more about um, what does this evidence mean? Mm. You know, and, and what can we say about the world because of this evidence? And uh, coming up, actually, the key difference, I think, is alternative explanations. That's really what skeptics do. And if you look at, even in Randy's history, what Randy has always done was provide an alternative explanation for something that looked like magic or the supernatural. And that's scientific. That's what science does. It provides alternative explanations and eliminates theories until you only have a few left and you still hold that tentatively because it might be wrong until something better comes along. But it's all about providing alternatives, not saying this is true, but maybe that the claim you're making may not be true because it could be this instead. Mm. I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow morning, so stay tuned. But, um, you know, I think that both, both aspects, uh, uh, these movements, however they relate, however they overlap, whichever is a subset of the other, and I agree with Barbara, it's really that the skeptic movement has the sort of the broader view and approach, um, um, and atheism is compatible with that for many, but not all atheist activists. Um, each piece of that puzzle has benefited from the other and mm. benefited tremendously from the recent growth. And at the same time, that recent growth has also created certain confusions and conflicts. And I think that's, I think that's in a state of being clarified. And while some of that clarification is causing, I think, some undue conflict in some ways, that's not constructive, I think in the end, that clarity hopefully will continue Will help. Will contribute to the continuing success of all of those pieces. Realize more and work for more what we have in common than arguing about what the differences are. But there are differences, and they should be clarified. So, along with the proliferation of national and regional events all over the country, people can really, and maybe this is not just in the ra larger rationalist movement or in atheism or in skepticism, but it seems like it's a middle class thing to do today these days to just go to a conference, right? It, it, that's more of a thing now than I the think it- The ideas industry. Right? It, right, right. There's sort of a, there's a, uh, a, a subculture of people who put on events for other people to consume. Uh, and some of, some of these events revolve around hobbies or interests or other passions, et cetera. And so um, and maybe the growth of the rationalist events uh, are part and parcel to that. But there's also been a growth of other skeptic products like the podcasts and the blogs and th it seems like there's a, an easier um, entry now to be uh, or uh, to begin being an opinion uh, sharer if not an opinion leader than there's ever been. It used to be, uh, th there used to be sort of a higher bar to uh, a higher hurdle to pass. And that's one of the hopes of the internet, right? That it's more egalitarian, more democratic, that anyone can put their stuff out there and then the best ideas win. Uh, but what are the downsides of that if there are any? The best, I best ideas don't always win. I if you're talking about numbers, it depends on what you mean by win. I think in the end, you know, the, the cream it does kind of rise in a sense, but it doesn't necessarily mean that your numbers are bigger. Numbers aren't necessarily um, success to me. Hmm. It may look like that. A democracy is messy, and every time democracy takes a step, egalitarianism takes a step, uh, it, it's messier, and people complain about the mess. Um, uh, you know, uh, it, it seems it seems almost a moot point to me. Um, 
because it's a marketplace of ideas, and uh, there is no nobody's going to be putting out the test for you know what, what what do you have to pass, what license do you have to get in order to speak up. Um, and I, I just think that you know it's the nature of information technology, which which is has a profound effect on all kinds of worlds. You know, I come out of the magic world. The magic world has been transformed culturally and artistically by information technology because we survived for centuries on secrecy. And a lot of that secrecy is gone. Uh, but look at publishing. You know, it used to be that you had to have some good ideas in your head before you got a book deal, before you get a book out, because of all the expense of publishing a book. But now, it's much easier to self-publish, so there's a, lot, there's a lot more lousy books. But that doesn't necessarily interfere with the opportunity for there to be good books. So it's a new and changing world, yes. But on the other hand, we have What's the Harm and Skeptic Camp and all of these fantastic resources that are easily accessed now that we didn't have before. Now, if I'm facing a skeptic conversation about something I actually don't know the answer to, oh, if only there was a device. Oh, yeah, I can get to the skeptic dictionary. You know, that's, that's, right. that's bookmarked. Right, right. Uh, so, uh, Tim, did you have a thought? Well, yeah, and this, it, it, the whole thing on the internet in terms of, there's a lot been written about the filter bubble and how people, everything's filtered now, uh, even your Google results depends on who you are and who your friends are. And so people tend to sort of get stuck in a bubble of the things they already uh, access and how are we as skeptics going to penetrate that bubble and how are we going to as skeptics detect when maybe we're stuck in a bubble and missing out on something and so there are a lot of people trying to figure out ways to deal with that through the technology building you know filtering tools or or uh, tools that ways to read content on the internet that that aren't so standardized so you're not stuck in the same sources over and over but uh, it, it, it is an interesting problem I would just add that it's, an, it's a particular problem for interesting challenge for, and lesson for skeptics because in an age of information, what is needed is skills of selection, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's what we ought to be, that's what the world needs to be teaching. Yeah. I mean, I wish my kids, you know, had a first or second or third grade class about how to judge good information from bad information, not just in the skeptic, in our skeptic sense, but in the larger world yeah, sense. Right. You can judge good information from bad information because the internet is full of both. And that's supposed to be a skeptic's purview. So I mean, I, I think that's a very interesting lesson and challenge for us. So as we've begun exploring the future of skepticism, we've talked a bit about the history, we've talked about the lay of the land now, these various ways that skepticism has changed recently and uh, suggests trends for change going forward. Let's end our discussion uh, with each of you making a skeptic's prediction about the future of skepticism. So, Jamie. Well, considering my line of work, <laughs> I haven't here a sealed prediction. <laughs> so you, want, you were saying five years look ahead? Was it in a jar? On about five, five years? Yeah. Okay, so open this in five years and we'll see how it gets. <laughs> there you go, there you no, go. No, no, but in case you're impatient, I thought you might, I know you, DJ, you're so impatient. Uh, Hurry up, Jamie, it please. Says, it says, uh, I, I haven't a clue. Uh, but, I, but, I do, but, but I do think that uh, the Simon Singh uh, chiropractic case, the, uh, dowsing, the, the dowsing bomb detection cases, I think these are really good uh, optimistic indicators of the impact and success that we can look toward uh, as increasing possibilities as a result of skeptic activism, as a result of you all being here and then going home and doing what you're doing on the ground. Um, those are cases where it's not, as I said, it's not one local group, uh, it's not one particular big national organization, it is the world and community of skepticism raising their voices when the opportunity occurs and having an undeniable impact. And I hope and I think we will see more of that. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I'm very, always very excited when I come to TAM and I see so many folks here because, uh, you know, every one of you is, it can make a difference uh, because of the internet technologies. I mentioned before that I've, I've noticed a leveling off in the number of podcasts and I don't know if that is means something, 
will remains to be seen. Maybe we've just we've we've saturated and, and gotten our podcasts and you know a hundred podcasts. That's a, that's a lot of material and that's a lot of healthy. That's a healthy uh, community right there. So that's a good sign. I, I think the the future is figuring out the, these things like the filter bubble and and figuring out ways to get better information in front of people using these internet uh, tools. And there's a lot of opportunities out there. And uh, we, we talked about crowdsourcing in my workshop yesterday, and I think that's that's the future: is everybody helping out, not just uh, you know, not just the national orgs do their thing and get with the media, but everybody else needs to be out there on the internet. And when the next Simon Singh needs you to raise your voice, you need to be ready to raise your voice. Uh, or if you you know there's a psychic who lives in your town and no one else has noticed them, you need to be the one that notices them so that the rest of us can raise our voices in defense of you. So uh, it's all a big part of the same thing. In inspired by Tim, I've been keeping metrics on the growth of Skepticamp over the last several years. And so I have hard numbers in which I'm going to <laughs> stake my reputation upon. Uh, I estimate, or at, at present, we just hit our 50th, 50th Skeptic Camp internationally. Uh, took place in Fort Collins, Colorado, a small campus town. Yeah, yeah Fort Collins. <laughs> uh, yeah, 50th. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, two different languages, English and Spanish, uh, for, for the Skeptic Camps, and in five countries so far. I estimate that uh, by July 2017, when TAM occurs here, uh, We'll see it in five different languages, uh, 10 countries, and a total of 200 skeptic camps. So four times where we are right now. By 2017, you're saying? Yep, July, tw July 2017. <laughs> 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 there we go. Well, I, I racked my brain because this is a perfect opportunity for some great jokes, but I'm not that funny. So, um, <laughs> that so was I'm, I'm going to try to deliver yeah. somebody else's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, climate change deniers will cause a ruckus at TAM 15, which will be held here at the South Point Hotel Casino in Seaport. <laughs> <laughs> and all, all of the jokes I did try to come up with had something to do with baldness, so I thought, you know, maybe adv advances in baldness treatments would finally make it able for us to tell apart some of the skeptics among us. In five years, we'll be up here on stage giving George a haircut. Yes, that's what I was thinking. Or maybe George would be the only one we could actually find in the crowd. <laughs> um, but I do have one that I, 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 I think that we're um, headed to the peak when it comes to vaccines. I, I actually see, I see a turnaround. And, and it may be more to do with the return of illnesses than with our efforts, but we're there with the right information when people get scared. So we have to take some credit for that. And I think in five years, we're gonna turn the tables on that to a point where it's no longer a skeptical issue. It's gonna be more of one of awareness than of fear. Because there are, you know, there are some diseases where we're under vaccinated simply because people aren't aware they need to be vaccinated, things like pertussis. And that, it, that probably has more to do with it at this point than fear. Um, but I, I think we're gonna hit that, I think we're gonna turn the tables on that. I think the fear's gonna start going the other direction. So growth of Skeptic right. Camp, popping the info bubble, uh, vaccines, the vaccine denialism solved, and you don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our panelists for this exploration on the future of skepticism.